Oh, I want to have her voice. Hello, everyone out there in Facebook land and YouTube land. I have a friend of mine here today with me. Oh my gosh, my cat is sleeping on my notes. I told you they were evil. Kevin says he's allergic to cats. And I say, that's this is the best place to have a cat is <laughs> on a Zoom call with you. Yeah. So I'm going to be speaking today with a friend of mine, Hemet Mehta, from the Friendly Atheist fame. And um, Hemet is, you know what? I don't think we've ever actually met in person. <laughs> I don't think we have. I, I know we've thinking. talked for such a long time and we've emailed a ton, <laughs> but yeah, never yeah. actually met. I've been on your podcast at least once, maybe twice. And I've heard so many of your podcasts and so many of your videos. And, so, and I've, every day I read your post. Uh, your your uh, RSS feed, I get yeah. an email. It hits about noon, so it comes <laughs> up, and there's three different articles, and I always read through those. I've been doing it for so long, but I feel like I've met you, like we've hung out, and that's awesome. But I don't feel when I think back on it, I don't think we've actually met. So yeah, and it's weird because we do run in some similar circles and stuff, and yeah. we've been doing this stuff forever. It's been a lot of fun uh, over yeah. the years, I guess. There's no money in it, but it, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> so well, what you're uh, doing is so important, so I always appreciate it. Oh, yeah, thank you. And what you're doing is great, too. So some of the things I wanted to say about him to start off with, well, I wanted to mention to everybody that we are broadcasting this live on Facebook, and hopefully you'll stay and hang around and ask some questions. Uh, we're trying to do it. I'm doing it differently than I have done the other about time uh, lectures I've done is because um, I started getting feedback from people that when I allowed people into the Zoom room with with the, the person I was talking to, it got really distraction, distracting because we were able to see what other people were doing and see uh. walking around or, you know, yawning or looking like they were disinterested or, or whatever. And so people watching the video even later, they would watch it and they would see they're focused on this other person who was just a watcher in the background. So I'm trying yeah. to just, just us two. You guys can ask questions. If I'm feeling it, maybe I'll let them come into the Zoom link to ask the question <laughs> in person afterwards, but we'll see what happens. That sounds good. So thank you so much for joining me today. Tell me a little bit about yourself for those people sure. that haven't read your Wikipedia page yet. <laughs> sure. So uh, my main gig is writing at friendlyatheist.com. I've been doing that for, man, like, 14, 15 years now. Hopefully it's gotten better over time, but basically trying to provide news for an atheist audience and commentary on what's going on in the world from an atheist for an atheist audience. So that's kind of been the, the main thing that I've been doing forever. Uh, more recently, I do stuff on YouTube under the Atheist Voice channel. That was an old one and now it's on Friendly Atheist. Um, I do a podcast called Friendly Atheist Podcast. I'm bad with names. I uh, am a father. <laughs> I know. Uh, I'm a father of two kids. I have, I coach a public high school uh, competitive, like forensics public speaking team. Um, and then a bunch of side projects here and there as they come up. But really the main thing I've been doing is writing about atheism and kind of the applications, I guess. I feel like I don't do a lot of arguing or debating with religious people. That's never been appealing to me. But, you know, for example, watching what they do politically and how that intersects with church-state separation and, and you know, right-wing Christianity in the government and how that affects policies. I feel like I can do a service by letting people who care about that stuff know what's going on, know why they should care about it, and hopefully uh, putting it in a way that is understandable to even people who don't necessarily agree with me on the atheist thing, because I hope, I hope they could read the articles and say, wow, this sounds disturbing and I'm religious and I'm also bothered by this, which I genuinely hope is true. Mm -hmm. Well, I, as I was saying, I get the RSS feed from you. I, I for some reason, I'm, I have gotten into that habit and I read a lot of things on face, Facebook. But this RSS feed I get from you is always three articles, and then they come at noon. I can, <laughs> I can look at them, and I can go through all three of them. And it's interesting how you have, um, you know, there's a lot of politics in there as, as well as, you know, obviously religion, but they're, they're merged together. And 
it, it's, it's frustrating at times for me to read it because it seems like you've been doing this for years and these articles don't change. You, <laughs> you, could, you could change the date. Or, I mean, right. if you erase the date, it would be the same thing uh, uh, this time. No joke. I, I sometimes am writing pieces where I'm like, what did I write about this two, three years ago? Because you're right, it probably hasn't changed too much. So mm -hmm. if I feel like I put a lot of time and effort into it years ago, let me just update it and talk about it now, which I think is a legit thing to do because some of these stories, lawsuits, for example, drag on for many years with appeals and going back and forth and stuff. But yeah, it it's interesting to watch like a sh there's because there's been like a demographic shift in the US. So people are moving away from religion. And at the same time, politically, it seems like the religious right has never had more power. So it, it it's always different types of issues. And yet it seems like it's the same stuff too. Well, one of the things I wanted to ask you right off the bat is how do you identify, um, you know, because you know, I'm, I'm heavily involved in the world of the psychics, uh, grief vampires, and so on. And we try really hard not to belittle those people who still are believing in the, uh, the world of the psychic. And, you know, I, I struggle sometimes to come up with a word or a phrase to be able to call those people just in a generic term. And we, we tend to call them believers. Right. Uh, in the psychic world, they call them shut eyes. And that means that they have their eyes shut. And that's a pejorative of sorts that psychics use to their- To talk followers. about you and people like you. To, no, to talk about their followers. Oh, those are the shut eyes. Yeah, the shut eyes are the people who follow uh, psychics around. And the psychic, the psychic business, I don't know if they still use this, but they did in the past. That was the term they used to, to talk about their fans, shut eyes. Oh. So, you know, I don't want to use a pejorative like that, obviously. Right. But- I'm uh, I'm wondering what word do you use or phrase do you use to talk about people who are who do profess to believe in some sort of uh, God God spiritual uh, something? You know, I've 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 never thought about the pejorative non pejorative thing so much, but I, I think I always just use believers as a catch all phrase. But I I do try on the website and when I'm talking about this stuff to make sure I am distinguishing between the, the people who believe in God, but who have values that are pretty much overlapping with my own, because I don't care about, those are so low on my priority list, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, we disagree about stuff, but like our difference about God means so little in the grand scheme of things that I genuinely care about. So I try hard to make sure like, I don't want to say Christianity is the problem because it's not. It's a specific type of Christian, politically speaking, who I have problems with. And there are plenty of Christians who share my views on that. So I've always tried to make sure, and believe me, I'm sure I'm, I've failed at times, but I do try to be cognizant of this, to say, you know, these are conservative Christians or white evangelicals because, you know, black evangelicals, I agree with like 95% of their stuff. So I think that is important to point out. So if I am talking about the people who believe in God, but whose values are pretty aligned with mine, I, I think just calling them Christian or believers or whatever, I'm just saying, look, yeah, they believe in God. So what? Let's talk about the things that matter because that is more important. I, I feel like when I started out as an activist, I was much more of a, yeah, let's hammer out our theological differences because that was important and I'm not saying it's not important but right now it's like the world's on fire let's talk <laughs> about priorities here and if you are if you happen to be religious but we sh we share like LGBTQ rights issues and women's rights issues and you see Trump the way I see Trump or whatever <laughs> it is it's like you know what interfaith cooperation let's do it I'm fine with that and, and I've seen this with a lot of atheist or church state separation organizations as well, they may be full of people who are hardcore atheists and care about that a lot. And like, if they were with you in a bar sometime, yeah, you could have a long argument about God and stuff like that. But they will put out a lot of press releases saying, hey, we're working with like the church state separation Baptists and the, you know, the, the Muslim organizations and Hindu organizations to say that this policy is bad for religious liberty, because we do care about that. But like, 
the real religious liberty, not the type that only helps, you know, right-wing Christians, stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I usually use, <laughs> what was the question? I think I use <laughs> believers when I'm talking about all that. But well, I, I, I'm glad to hear that because it's, it gets really complicated if we have to come up with some new phrase that yeah. I, I tend to use the word believers also, and I'm trying not to use it in a negative, necessarily pejorative kind of way, but it's kind of a catch-all for it is. those people who still believe in this phenomena that I don't, I don't feel there's any efficacy for or anything. But um, one of the things, the hallmarks of you, yourself, and your, and your brand is that you are the friendly atheist. And I think that that comes across a lot. You know, I've been reading you for years, and it feels like you're doing, you've really made the difference between um, the enemy is not those people, those believers, those people who either believe because they have no choice, you know, they're forced to, that's a religion, they have nowhere to go, or they were raised in it and they've never really thought about it, or, you know, all the different reasons they're, they still tend to believe they haven't gotten there in their thinking process, maybe never will to, to uh, challenge their, uh, their belief structure, but you've always been kind and you've always been empathetic. And when you do get a bit of a temper, and I've seen that come through in some of your blogs a little bit, it's always about either the institution or the, the um, something specific, you know, politics, yeah. some law, some, some, some person who is harming children and it, and then they just like say, Oh, well you can keep your job. It's okay. You know, cause, they were too young to remember. I don't know, but it's just like you can see here your anger come through sometimes. But for the most part, you've always kept your head and you are really reasonable. And I'm wondering, do you get a lot of feedback from the believing community that besides the, the book, because I want to talk about your book in a minute, but you know, do you get a lot of letters from people who say, oh, you're a reasonable atheist I can actually have a discussion with? Or what, what do you yeah. So to go back, first of all, thank you for saying all that stuff, because I've said many times recently, like, I don't even know that friendly necessarily applies to me necessarily, because I think I do get angry about a lot of things a lot of times. Um, and that it, I didn't use the word friendly to begin with to describe myself. It was because I know a lot of atheists, they're not angry or militant or staunch or aggressive. They're decent people. So like, if anyone's going to use my website name, to describe something, I'm gonna make you say friendly. But um, <laughs> I, I do get emails, like I do, I have a separate folder, like where I keep nice letters people send me in Gmail. And yeah, some of them do come from religious people. And the ones I appreciate are the ones who have read me, like you have, for a while. So they know where I'm coming from. They know what I get upset about. And they will be straight up and just say, look, I am a believer, but this thing is something you will probably feel the same way I do about. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I appreciate, I love tips, you know, when I, when it comes to stories and stuff, like you got an, a lead for me, bring it on. <laughs> and, and they come from religious people as much as they do other atheists. So that means a lot that they trust me with that, that they, they don't even have to say like, please don't be mean to this religious person in the story. Cause it's not about that. And because they know I'm not going to be, I'm not going to pick on someone just because they're a believer. I mean, I'll give you an example of this. Like, this is a long time ago, so I feel comfortable sharing this now. I once saw someone writing a criticism of an obituary because it said some guy had dedicated his life to God. That's it. He seemed to be a decent person. He just happened to be like when he volunteers and works with people, it was done through his church. So they included that in there. So I'm looking at that. I'm like, seems like a decent guy. Is he right about the God thing? No, who cares? Seems like a pretty decent person. But the thing I was reading was very critical of like how he had dedicated his life to what atheists would consider to be a lie. Mm -hmm. I feel like that is unfair and kicking people while they're down. Like, who cares? That's such a meaningless distinction at that point. Let's talk about what people do with that belief. And I think anyone who's read me for a while knows, yeah, I, I really only care about what you're doing with it. There is a separate conversation to be had about what underlies our belief systems, because I'm sure any, anyone critical of what I'm saying right now might say like, well, yeah, but the belief itself, that that mode of thinking is what might lead to 
bad thinking and bad values down the line. And that is a fair point. I will give people that. But at the same time, you and me and plenty of other people, we all know religious people who have not descended into madness because of their religious beliefs. They're not going to. I mean, I will include my parents in this mix. They are religious. They always have been. I was raised religiously. These, these are good people who are wrong about the God thing, but it's not like they're going to use that to go overboard. And so all I'm saying is I, I don't feel like it's a good use of my time mm -hmm. to go after those arguments and that criticism and all that. I'm not saying it's not useful. I just don't think it's a good use of my time when there's so many bigger fish to fry in terms of the uh, what people are doing with religion overall. Because if you want to talk about the harm that religion causes, they're not the ones doing the damage. It's elsewhere. Let's focus there. So I think on YouTube and, and the blog, I definitely try to aim my focus or put my focus where I think it counts or where I can at least offer some criticism. Um, and I think there have been plenty of times when I have praised churches. I mean, this is not the focus of the website, so it doesn't happen every day, but like we praise religious people who do the right thing. Uh, I know I've said this politically speaking, because in the Democratic Party, there are so many religious people in positions of leadership and they're awesome. Like I don't, I mean, I wish they were all more progressive, but by and large, like, I like them. I don't care if Joe Biden brings up his faith because he's not legislating it. Mm -hmm. So, like, who, whatever. I've, I've heard from atheists, like, I don't want to vote for him. He's too religious for me, but Trump is not openly, <laughs> he panders with religion, but he's not really religious. And it's like, how do you not know the difference? But I don't know. So I try to, I try to keep my focus where I think it's due. I, I totally agree. I, I'm starting to see Republicans in a whole new light. It feels like there's <laughs> Trump and his ilk, and then yeah. there are other Republicans. And I'm starting to feel a whole new appreciation for some of the some of the platforms of the Republican Party, the the McCain's and even yeah. the Romneys and the you know I I'm still not going to vote for them probably, but exactly. I, I feel I feel a whole new aff aff affinity towards them. That there is this huge difference between the two political that one party, and so I think it's been kind of eye opening for me. I think to see it I saw way. this on Twitter maybe, but like there is this group of Never Trump Republicans who are actively encouraging people to vote for Joe Biden, mm -hmm. and they're basically saying, "Look, we don't love his policies, but he's a good guy. We disagree with him," and the, one of the things is, you know what? Take their money, take their creativity with the ads, which are amazing. Oh, they are, yeah. Run with it, and that is great. And if Biden wins, you should never listen to anything those people have to say, because <laughs> who cares? But use it, because good, that takes some courage. And we see this in religious and atheist institutions all the time, where if you don't necessarily have a platform and you're not the biggest fish there, like, it is really hard to speak out against leaders in your thing. Like we're seeing this at Liberty University right now, right? Like we're dozens of alums and staffers, staffers, like are speaking out against Jerry Falwell because he's a racist. And they're like, how hard? I mean, look, I have a problem with people who choose to go to Liberty, but this goes back to priority thing. Like, okay, if you're working there, you've signed a statement saying you share certain values that I find disgusting. But if you're willing to speak out against Jerry Falwell and stuff like that right now, and your job is on the line, okay, good for you. Like that is not a small thing. So good, that's a start. And, and I'm sure you've heard this too. I've heard this from every atheist I've ever talked to who has been vocal, active on any platform ever, where if they do it for a while, they will hear from people who said, I was religious, but once I started watching or reading or listening to you, it's not that they just switched to being an atheist, it's that they started thinking that way. Mm -hmm. And if I can help change your mindset, like where you see a story and you're like, oh, here's how I think about this now, because I, I've kind of learned how to think that way, Great. Like that's all I have heard from people who have said that. And again, if you can get people to maybe take that step away where they're like, all right, I'm going to be critical of 
Jerry Falwell Jr. or something. Uh, who knows where that leads down the road? But that's kind of, that's what you can hope for. That's what you can ask for. And if they do it, good for them. And you know what? If they don't become atheists or they don't, if they're still religious by the end of it, whatever. It's a start. That, yeah. So I have a lot of respect for these people right now who are uh, the Republicans speaking out against Trump, the uh, mm -hmm. the Christians speaking out against bad actors in their institutions, the, all the the women who have spoken out, like in the Southern Baptist Convention and the Catholic Church, uh, or rather more the Southern Baptists in the past couple of years, like, man, they're going up against their pastors and these very powerful people. It's amazing. Yeah. And they're menfolk. <laughs> yeah. A yeah. lot of pressure. I mean... I mean, seriously, there is. The, I, I think of Nancy Pelosi, who I absolutely adore, and she has a very strong faith from yeah. what she's always talking about. And what I'm really, you know, she goes, she had Ash Wednesday, she had a little ash on her little forehead. Right, and, right. You know, she talks about her faith and praying for Trump and, and the different things she does. It, she just is brilliant. You know, I, I watch her, how she, she, she talks about Trump and how she does things. I, I find I'm, I have a lot of sympathy with her. And one of the things she says a lot, and when you, she's talking especially about the coronavirus, she says, I have a lot of faith. I pray about this all the time. We have to lead with science. We have to right. go where science tells us to go. And so while you know, we have to build, and I, I assume that you feel the same way, we need to find a way of making bridges with these people. We can't, um, you know, I come from a, I've been involved in the skeptic movement for a long time. I came in as an atheist. That was my first uh, foray into it to some extent. And it shifted over time to more, I'm more interested in the, well, obviously in the psychics, but into the other areas of, of um, skepticism and scientific skepticism. But I've met so many people who the, I run a, a local group, Monterey County Skeptics, and people join my group. And when they join, almost all of them are atheists. That's what brought them in. And they tell me the same thing all the time, that they have not had anybody to talk to about this. Right. They, this is the first time they've had somebody that under, has read Dawkins or who understands who Christopher Hitchens is and all these things. And a lot of them come in and they've just got these They've got like a chip on their shoulder and they've got um, these arguments fight. that are like, yeah. I have, I've heard that argument 10 years ago, you know, these stupid <laughs> little memes that they come up with and you're like, you know, I, I'm so past that now. But I'm I do, on Reddit. I've seen them. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I feel like this, you have to understand to these people, this is their first step in. Right. And I might have been like that 10 years ago or 15 years ago as well. And so we sympathize with that and you're like, yeah, got it. You're, 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 this is the first time you're able to speak out. I guess it's like a person who... I've said that about Reddit too, more yeah. so Reddit than like in-person meeting, because I've heard people trash like Reddit atheism as a very like, yeah, people want to pick a fight with you. And it's hard to have this conversation online with anybody. But yeah, my reaction is pretty much the same, which is you are talking to people who never had an outlet for this stuff. And so when they post memes that I would consider simplistic <laughs> yeah. or they they boil religious or religious ideas down to some idea and it's like well it's all stupid whatever um yeah it it doesn't work for me it doesn't do anything but like i kind of get the release that you get when you can laugh at that when you can post that um it is really interesting by the way to watch what people post on like x christian x mormon x jehovah witnesses subreddits too because they're coming from a very specific subculture and when they finally realize, wait, there are other like Jehovah's Witnesses who are out and they can talk about it. Like it's a very different conversation you can peer in on. Um, but yeah, it, I, am, I don't know if you feel the same way. I've never had a chance to ask you this. Like um, I'm, I'm in my like late thirties. And so when I got into atheism, so I'm in early high school, the only things that were available were like resource wise, were random it looked like websites with people clearly typing from their basement bunkers and saying why religion sucks but that's what got me thinking about this stuff for the first time and i'm almost like seriously jealous of how many different options people have now because if you are looking for the dawkins ask let's just dunk on religion sort of thing you definitely have that option but i've also seen depending on which medium people are using, there are more women, more people of color talking, more types of voices 
talking about very different things. Cause like on YouTube, for example, there are people who will definitely say, let's pick apart Christian apologetics and fight about the Bible and things like that. That's great if you're into that sort of thing. But there are other people who are like, let's talk about current events. Let's talk about uh, evangelical subculture because they are from that or Mormon subculture, or what have you. Like there's so many ways for you to realize you're not alone and people you can look up to in a sense, like they've been there, they've walked down this journey. They like, I feel this as an Indian guy too, when I meet another Indian person, there's so much we have in common that inside jokes and stuff that you would get that no one else would get. Um, and they get that when they're meeting someone else who came from the same religious upbringing. Um, that is amazing. And I'm kind of like, there's, it's this uh, flood of riches when it comes to how people can get into the, the world, the subculture, whatever you want to call it. Well, we have more in common, I think, than, than we have not in common with people. And I think just having conversations and finding that commonality is going to open the door, especially when they, I mean, when I was growing up, I was raised Southern Baptist. I'm in California, so I didn't have any family, no relatives, but my mom was uber Southern Baptist. Yeah. But, you know, in California light, so it wasn't so bad. But the idea of atheism had never occurred to me. And I was 19, no, 17 when I heard the word atheist for the first time. Wow. And that was my teacher in my homeroom class was saluting the flag, you know, as you do in your homeroom class. Uh, and he missed the under God part. You know, at 17, I thought I'd do everything, <laughs> right? So he, he missed that, and I asked him, Mr. Foreman, why did you not say, did you forget or what? He goes, oh, no, I'm an atheist. And I thought, well, what is that? And, I, and for a very <laughs> long time, it was, that was my moment where I, had, I would look it up in dictionaries, encyclopedias. It was the first time I'd heard it and yeah. understood it as a word. And the thought that happened to me first is that you mean it's possible to not believe? Because I had been having problems with religion for years, and I kept looking into different religions, thinking, oh, there's something wrong with my Southern Baptist faith. There must be something out there, Catholic, something, something, something. And I was looking around, and it never dawned on me. I mean, I was, I am, I guess I am kind of a gullible person, I guess, in a lot of ways, but I'll admit it. But uh, we, I never dawned on me that we couldn't be and then i went and i went to the library which is the only yeah. place i could go i mean you're saying where else are you gonna go right so i went to the library i found madeline murray o'hare's book um why i'm an atheist or all about atheists or something yeah. like that. and i would check the book out but i was terrified because my mother would have had a, a fit <laughs> if she'd seen if that she book. I, you know, I would have been disowned so it was right. like having porn you know, right, right, you kept right. it under the covers, you put it under the mattress, you hid it in the, in the closet. But I kept reading through the book because that was my only outlet and I had no one to talk to. And when I it's, checked out the library. It's so weird when you can read that. something like that and it right. makes sense. I was like, what? Yeah. Yes. So I couldn't check out the book. So whenever I'd go to check out the book, I would distract the person who was, was back in the old days. <laughs> they would scan it. No, they wouldn't scan it. They would stamp it. They opened the cover and stamp yes. it. So I had to distract the person. I put all these other books in front of it and behind it. And so hopefully she would just open it up and stamp it. And I'd say, oh, great weather we're having or something like right. that. She wouldn't notice it. But I that checked out awesome. that book so many times. But we had nothing. There was nobody right. to talk to. There really wasn't. And I was raised without a lot of family around. So I didn't even have that. But AOL. Well, just pick, yeah, piggybacking on that. I used AOL too. Uh, um, the, no one was writing about Jainism, which is the religion I grew up with. So when I was reading about that stuff, it was coming from a perspective of Christianity, but just saying, here's why God doesn't exist. And I'm like, I know they're not talking about the beliefs I was raised with. So I guess it's not my religion that's a problem. It's religion that's a problem. And I kind of piggyback, or I'm sorry, leapfrogged over all the other religions. And I'm like, yep, I don't think any of this makes sense. But think about all the books that are out there now and just... I, it's amazing. I, I'm very curious always how people get into this stuff because mm -hmm. you're right. I could totally understand someone coming in through Madeline's books or through like certain websites that were around 20 some years ago or whatever. Uh, and now they're all coming in from all over the place. I, I've said this before, like when I give talks at colleges, virtually none of the students know me from my website, uh, even though that's what I do all the time. They only know me from YouTube. 
which it's like, oh, all right, well, that's how you're getting into this. Like, I need to get on TikTok or something now, because <laughs> I guess that's where people are going to find other atheists. Get your dance moves on. I know, which is, <laughs> I'm not even going to pretend I know how to do it on here. Yeah. Maybe you have some special skill that's a, that's a nice TikTok. I'll just play the music in the background and just <laughs> stare at a screen. I'm yeah. in it uh, from Burnley yeah. Atheist. <laughs> <laughs> Worst TikTok Get a cat. Ever. That'll do it every time. Get a cat. <laughs> It'll let your kids play. I don't, I don't know. Yes. Let's, let's talk about your book. Um, I Sold My Soul on eBay. And yeah. um, I was going to screen share because, you know, I've got this fancy, I've got Zoom. So let, let me try it. Let me try <laughs> showing just the picture of the book here really quick for anybody who hasn't seen this. This is, can you see my soul? My there soul? it is. Okay. Yeah. Good. All right. So I did that correctly. I'm learning. I'm learning. So, um, that's such this, a long but, time ago. I know, but this to me was, you know, how we we're just talking about TikTok and we're just yeah. saying that there, you, who knows what it is that could make the thing make you go viral, make you big right. on there. This idea of selling your soul on eBay is just wonderful. It's a great story. <laughs> it's not something you could have planned to happen no. like that. You were just selling it on, you know. Uh, for it, it happened uh, when I was quitting grad school and trying to figure out what the hell to do with my life. <laughs> um, that, that a series of things happen where I'm like, well, I have a lot of spare time right now and I have no idea what the hell to do with it. And I also, I have no money, so I got to do some part-time work to try to make some money, but I also have a lot of free time. Mm -hmm. That is when that stuff happened. And I, I, even then I thought, okay, this is a cool viral fluke, but I, I kind of even at the time knew what that meant, which is that It'll be cool for like a few minutes and then no one will remember any of it. Um, and even after that book came out, I remember like no one, like I'm not being falsely modest here. No one cares about the book. But what it allowed me to do is to say the, the thing that led to the book was me writing about visiting a whole bunch of churches that I never had attended. And what that got me doing is like, I'm writing about my experiences in these churches, most of which were designed to, like they said this, we're trying to reach people who are unsaved. Hey, that's me, I'm your target audience. Let me go to one of your services and I'll tell you what I think. Um, and, and doing like basically a blog about, here's what I experienced there and watching people interact and respond and criticize and all that. And it's like, wow, I got it. That was so cool that I could write stuff that people were responding to and getting into very interesting discussions. And that's how I got into blogging anyway. Cause once the book was over, it's like, oh, I kind of miss doing that. That was really fun. Even though I'm not visiting churches like that anymore. But I mean, it was that thing that kind of led to the blog that I have now. So as much as I'm not the person who wrote that book anymore in my own head, it's like, cool, I, I was able to leverage whatever experience and journey that came with to starting to talk about this stuff in a different way now. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, anyone who's read that book, which all three of you, I'm sure, like, oh, you know what hey, I mean? Like, hey. But anyone who's read that book and reads my blog now, I think you would find it, it's a very different voice. It's a very different feeling toward religion. Um, it just because that was published, I think, in 07. So it's been a while. And Has think it been about that long? Yeah, and how much wow. has happened since then, like, I have so many different opinions on all of this stuff now that uh, I haven't gone back to read the book, but like, I kind of remember a bunch of the stuff in there. And I'm like, I wouldn't write like that. I wouldn't think like that about a lot of things. Um, so it is, it is interesting whenever anyone brings up that book, because I'm like, I really want to know what you read and who you think I am. <laughs> because I don't think I am that person. I would hope I'm not that well, back up for just a second, because one of the things that happened is you you did go to eBay and say, somebody pay me money and I will go to your church for... And I will document it, yes. Yeah, but what happened was it wasn't that that led to the book necessarily. It was somebody else heard your story. Yeah. And this is how it always seems to happen is that... Right. You it know, a weird, it's a weird series of events said, like... Can you write a, a, did he have a travel blog or what was his, what um, was his uh, who was the guy again? What was his Jim name? Jim Henderson was the guy. There's a lot of links in here, but like basically the, the winning, the, the person who was basically going to win that auction 
uh, was a pastor who said, I want you to come to my church for a year. And a Jim, year. a year, that's how much money he was going to give me, like 500 bucks. And Jim Henderson was this other pastor who his whole ministry's shtick was, we are Christian, but we really hate Christian culture and all the, the fakeness that comes with it. And so one thing that Jim loved to do is he would go to pastors who said, I'm trying to reach people who don't go to church. And Jim would corral them outside their building saying, I'll give you money if you go to this church. All you got to do is fill out this survey for me, like oh. on paper. And Jim would then take all these surveys after the service saying to the pastor, hey, you want to reach unchurched people? Well, a dozen of them just went to your service. Here's what they said about you. They all hate you. And here's, <laughs> here's why. So like, that's what he was doing. And so when he heard about this auction, he's like, yes. And he was savvy enough about eBay to know like, well, if the bidding is going to go to 500, I'm just going to go a little above that. And he did. And he won. He like, what was the word? The, uh, it starts with an S. But he ended up winning that auction. And what he said to me is, look, I don't want you to go into one church for a year because that would be boring for him. And it would, he's like, and that would be boring for you too. So go to a bunch of different ones. Write about your experience on my ministry's website. And that got a lot of publicity and a book publisher, a Christian book publisher said, you know, they, um, it happened to be an imprint that said, that really published a lot of books that pushed the boundaries of evangelical uh, culture. Uh -huh. They loved publishing those books that got a lot of controversy. So actually in recent years, they published ones by Christian authors who said, the Bible is fine with homosexuality. You know, like that's what the type of uh, book publisher this was. But that editor said, you know, we're watching this and it's very interesting, the experiment. And we kind of like the idea of an atheist going to these services um, because they're, I don't think they really had a good way of, it's not like they were going to hire an atheist for any other reason, you know, give a book contract to another atheist. Um, so, I mean, that the I Sold My Soul on eBay book was in a Christian publisher and a these are evangelicals all the way through and an editor who said we want you to go to other churches we don't want to replicate the old stuff go to different places go to some of the bigger churches around the country so i went to joel osteen's church i went to rob bell who was a big deal at the time uh ted haggard who is still in the pulpit at the time and they said we'll, we'll send you to all these places maybe some smaller ones too tell us what you think and I will say my experience working with them was fantastic. Like they really did help me craft my voice the way I wanted to say this stuff. Um, even though they also had an audience and they have their own uh, religious obligations to meet. Um, but it was a really good experience. And that's kind of how all that happened. If anyone listens to This American Life, the radio show, the podcast, there is an episode, if you search, it's called Bait and Switch. And they actually mentioned Jim Henderson and the eBay experiment in one of the transitions or something. But he, uh, Ira Glass talks to Jim about kind of his whole take because Jim hates Christian pastors who are like, I want to be your friend. I want to reach out to you. Come to my church. But really, they're just painting a target on your back to convert you. And Jim always hated that. And so they talked to him about that for that episode. So anyway, that's, that's what that book was about. And it, I was lucky that it worked out like as a book, it worked out as a experience and, and I wouldn't, wouldn't do it again, but it was cool. You became a church consultant for a while. Though. I know. Right. Yeah. I think it's great. It's, 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 it's super clever. So do you yeah. worked as a, as a elementary no, a high, high school math teacher? For a while. Yeah. Right? That was after that was after the eBay stuff where I'm like, what the hell am I doing with my life? So actually, while the eBay stuff was all happening, I was probably getting my teaching certificate and student teaching while all that was happening. And then I think the book probably came out in April and I started actually teaching math that August. So I taught for like seven years. Yeah. Now, I have uh, written down here two things that I needed to ask you is that in 2010 is when you got your, your master's degree, right? Yeah. And then in 2012, you got, did you get a certification? Certificate? Cer so, yeah. Certification, certification in teaching? Uh, I got my teaching certificate in 
whenever that was, probably 07 or something, and I was teaching. I got my master's. Uh, I, I'll take your word for it that it was 2010. I don't well, remember. Well, I'm just trying to correct But I got it. my master's. I, there's a special thing called a uh, national board certification, which is like, uh, if you're a doctor, you could be a doctor, but like a board certified doctor <laughs> is like the cream of the crop. And there is actually a board certification for teachers, which involves things like you're writing a bunch of essays about your craft, you are videotaping your lessons and analyzing them. It was a ton of work. I did it with a cohort, basically, um, under the premise that we would get a salary, we'd get a raise if we were national board certified teachers. And then of course, the district took away the raise, so it was eh. But it was a, I, I, I still technically am national board certified math teacher. And if, if you know any teachers, like, that's a thing I think a lot of teachers know about. So it's cool. Well, that's really good. So yeah. what that just allowed me to fix that citation needed on your <laughs> page. So yeah. any of my GSOW editors are watching us right now. Whenever I put this <laughs> video on YouTube, you can use it as a citation to take that citation needed nice. off of this Wikipedia page. Just saying, you guys, make your own citations if you can't find it somewhere else. There you go. So I have a couple things I've got to go, and they're just completely yeah. different opposite directions. So let me think. Okay. The satanic church. Yeah. So they, I've learned so much about them by reading your blog. And, um, you know, I've written some, uh, Wikipedia pages. We've written a Wikipedia page or two about the satanic church, uh, the satanic general, temple. Yeah, yeah. Satanic temple and different things. We've written the good news club, mm -hmm. the yeah. bad, uh, the after school, um, after school, Satan. After school Satan. We wrote that Wikipedia page. We wrote yeah. David, uh, Oh God, it's been so many years. The guy in Florida that was going to the uh, to the um, the school board meetings, and he was doing Pastafarianism, and then yeah, his last David name Suter, is Suter. S U yes, S U T E R. We wrote that hilarious and absolutely terrifying at the same time. But it seems like this Satanic Temple has just made a sea change in activism for atheism just by getting in there and saying okay we're going to put up a, a fine okay you want well, the two commandments we'll put our bullet what is it bullet <laughs> uh baphomet yeah the baphomet, statue of baphomet. Up the no problem it'll look really it's, good next to the ten commandments and sure no problem <laughs> the flying spaghetti monster was started out as like this serious joke like mm -hmm. against evolution the teaching of evolution in kansas but the whole thing was like everyone knows it's satirical so if you're trying to use, well, I'm a Pastafarian to do you're anything, you're not, your head, yeah. Yeah, you're not going to really get anywhere necessarily. Sometimes they get driver's license pictures and whatnot. But the Satanic Temple, they were very, whether it was intentional or not, they're saying, nope, this is what we believe. We do have a set of principles and tenets. And yeah, you don't like it because it's uncomfortable for people who don't like Satan. But too bad. These are our deeply held religious beliefs. They use all the language of the religious right, legally speaking, mm -hmm. saying, well, as long as we believe it, then we can get away with doing anything that you guys are doing. So, oh, you allow religious monuments outside the courthouse? Well, guess what? We will be able to raise enough money to put a religious monument of our religion. And by the way, that lawsuit is still going on in Arkansas right now, I believe, because yeah. there is a Ten Commandments monument out there. Um, but yeah, they're, they're clever in the sense that like, they're just saying we are a real religion. We believe this. I know some people think they are trolls. I don't particularly care uh, <laughs> if that's true or not. But like, they're just saying, nope, we are Satanists. We, we do believe in this thing. They don't believe in Satan. They say that out loud. But they're like, no, here are our principles. Mm -hmm. They just lost a lawsuit yesterday about this. But the point is, they're just adapting the language of the religious right, which has always been, if we believe it, you can't question it. And we're allowed to create loopholes for ourselves. And they just took that and ran with it. And it is entertaining because they're very good about if something is going on in someone's neck of the woods. And you're like, oh, they're allowing invocations in this city? Well, we need a Satanist in Florida who can ask for permission to speak because what are they going to do? It's a fun game to play. It has been <laughs> fascinating, and it's been a few years, but like I said, it's, yeah. it's, it's a sea change. You know, all these years where we're like, okay, we need a wall of separation between the church and the state, and, uh, you know, whatever they were doing, like an invocation or something like that, you would say, you know, that, that kind of 
Same well, it's problem. always, the Same argument problem. is always, we can't let atheists do this thing because the rule says it has to be a religious mm -hmm. belief. And unfortunately, you don't have a lot of quote unquote weird religious people who sign up to do any of that stuff. Like it's always one type of Christian 99% of the time. So to be able to say, fine, if you're going to give atheists hell about doing any of this stuff, and legally speaking, sometimes atheists are prevented from giving invocations or whatever because they say, nope, only religious invocations apply. There is value to having a group oh, yeah. that works like the atheist groups, but uh -huh. says, nope, we do have a religious belief. Um, and by the way, I should say, I have seen secular humanists make that same argument saying, nope, this is, we are class, I, you may have to correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, maybe the American Humanist Association did this. I can't remember if I'm right or not. But I think they said, nope, we are classifying ourselves as a religion um, so that we can basically do the same thing in court. Our religion is humanism. It is a non-theistic religion, but it's a religion. We believe in stuff. We, I don't, uh, again, I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that. But the point is like, there is value to being able to use their arguments. And if you have a problem with religion, I mean, if you want to get rid of the Satanists, if you want to stop them from speaking at invocations, the only way you can do that is to say no religious invocations. It's like, it's like, you know, people ask nicely. They say, oh, you know, we would like you to take down the Ten Commandments. We would like yeah. you to not pray, uh, have uh, school uh, prayer led by teachers. We'd like this, we'd like that. And if they say, sorry, we're not going to do that, it's like, all right, send in the Satanists. Well, the Bring best example, I mean, just this week, this happened, Tennessee just passed a law allowing, about forcing school districts to let kids skip an hour of school every oh, day yeah, yeah. to go to church. And they did a trial run of this in the Knox County public schools in Tennessee, where it was once a month, kids could leave for a little bit of time if they wanted to go to church without penalty. And all of a sudden, a satanic group said, well, guess what? We're offering services, too. Um, I'm, I don't even know how many people took them up on it. But now Tennessee lawmakers have passed a law. I think it's just awaiting a governor's signature to force every district to allow kids to skip an hour of school every day to go to church. And I think there's a legit question of what happens if a mosque says, all right, we're going to let kids do this, or a satanic group, which does exist, specifically mm -hmm. for this purpose, saying, nope, we're going to offer something every day. And what happens when kids end up going to those uh, things? Because I think any, the lawmakers who pass these types of laws, they basically know, you know what? Muslims aren't going to take advantage of this. Jews are not going to take advantage of this. Christians will. That's why we're doing it. So when you have a Satanist or whoever saying, nope, we're playing this game too. Um, it's it's been Scientology. Yeah, get Scientologists in there. Make it fun. Oh, yeah. It's just been fascinating. I mean, sci uh, um, Satanist uh, coloring books and mm -hmm. just the... <laughs> when they were distributing Bibles in public schools, they said, well, guess what? Satan has got a book, too. And the I, school had to let them pass out the coloring book. It's, it's, it's just going to take... It feels like it's going to take a few more years. And this <laughs> is going to just... You know, it's like... Anyway, I, I've been... It's, I love it. Like, just watching it on the sideline going, oh, this is... This is hilarious. And like I said, we've been writing the Wikipedia pages just to make it a little bit more, give them a little more promotion, a little more sure. legitimacy. So here's another question I really yeah. have to ask you about. Okay, totally different subject. So I'm heavily involved in the scientific skepticism movement. That is my thing. Yeah. We have said, and this comes up on a topic, almost every dang meeting we've ever had, back in the day when we could have those meetings in person, <laughs> we would talk about atheists, skeptics, are almost all atheists, but uh -huh. not all atheists are skeptics. And it's weird, you know? How can you be such a strong critical thinker in one area and then still believe in crystals or right. um, psychics? I mean, I think, I think Rob Palmer was saying that 10% of uh, non-religious people or atheists say that they believe in psychics. And I've had two women come to me and say, um, you know, I have this reading by a psychic and I need to understand how it was done. I'm an atheist. And I'm like, w -w what? You're an uh, atheist? And you believe that there's life after death that you can talk to these people? Excuse me, how, how, where, woo, where does well, that and it, go? And what does that show? That shows us that 
I, I don't know if you ever had this thought. I have definitely had this thought that there is this whole world of critical thinking and skepticism that, of course, we want people to think critically and not believe in things that are untrue. And to me, it always seemed like religion was kind of the head of the monster. Mm -hmm. And so if I could help people stop being religious, it would trickle down and they would be skeptics about all this other nonsense as well. Like you're saying, that did not happen. <laughs> Um, and I wouldn't just limit it to that because you're right. And especially it's annoying whenever I see surveys come out and they lump us all into the nuns because oh, yeah. the nuns believe so much crap, whereas atheists don't believe as much crap. But you're right. There are always these, this pocket of people who believe in horoscopes and psychics and the afterlife and all of that stuff. But it does show like whatever, there, there was a disconnect between whatever it is we did to convince people God doesn't exist it did not cross over, pun intended, to, to whatever the pseudoscience was in other realms, because it's not just that. I mean, there are, uh, name, take your pick. If it's not horoscopes or psychics, it is climate science. It is name your policy choice. There are plenty of atheists who I would argue reject scientific consensus in politics. They reject evidence-based policy when it comes to policing, when it comes to all, I mean, there's, we could expand this world of atheists who believe things that seem to me utterly irrational and mm -hmm. ridiculous and not based on science or evidence or reason. So it's not just the thing you're talking about. It's so much stuff. And yeah, and this, I mean, the truth is this is part of any subculture that at one point atheism as a movement was small enough that, yay, there's a Dawkins book out. Woohoo. And then as it grows, of course, there are going to be fissures and everyone goes their own ways and everyone has their own subculture within the sub. It happens everywhere. That's true of the LGBTQ movement. That is true of people who love the NRA. They have their own arguments about whatever it is they care about. Like this is true of uh, name your TV show fan base that you love. Those things always happen. So it's not like it's unique to us. It is true. Like, whatever it is that convinced them God doesn't exist, they did not apply that to other things, which, right. which I guess means whatever reasons worked for me to convince me God doesn't exist, they have very different reasons because whatever the principle is, it doesn't seem to apply anywhere else. So maybe they just stop believing in God for a very different reason than I followed the evidence and it took me there. Mm -hmm. That's not what did it for them. It's fascinating. It's just fascinating. Yeah. So let's see. You know, did you, do you, I know you see this. How many uh, articles, at, like the New York Times runs a ton of them saying like, let's talk about horoscopes and all the, it's like, what are you doing? Stop <laughs> treating them as if they matter. Like every article about horoscopes should just be no. And no. then we're done. No. But they don't. They treat it like it's legit. Not, they don't say it's true. They say some people believe in it. Like, but also like a, let's give it space. Let's give it air time. I, I think we're in a culture where people think, and I don't know where this came from, but uh, I'll blame millennials, but <laughs> <laughs> okay, boomer. But yeah. they, you know, this <laughs> idea that we're all, everybody's opinion is valid. Everybody's, you know, evidence means nothing anymore. Yeah. Not, you know, it's like, well, that's my belief and that's the way it is. And so therefore right. I'm right. And you're like, when did that become okay? You know, <laughs> this idea yeah. of uh, expertise is just out the door. Well, you know, yeah. don't start about politics. But where do you I, see? I don't. I've heard this. I read this somewhere. Like, we need to. If you want people to listen, stop calling them experts and start calling them specifically, like for journalists. Don't say this person is an expert in COVID or whatever. Say. This is an epidemiologist who is someone who has studied the spread of viruses for their entire career. I know it's longer and bulkier, but that is a better word to say than here's an expert in this field. Because some people are just like, expert? No, thank you. I know I better than Google. you do. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one way to persuade more people is not to say this person is a skeptic or this person is an expert. You say this is someone who has dedicated their life to explaining why psychics are fooling people. And that is a more convincing way to get through to some people than just saying they're an expert in this field. Right. Well, what does that mean anymore? I'm learning, I have learned, as you were saying earlier in the conversation, I'm learning more to how to 
uh, when I'm talking to somebody and people write to me all the time now uh, saying, you know, they got a reading from somebody and they're like, can you explain how that must have happened? I've read your article and I don't understand he could have pot read me. Because, how did he know that? You know, yeah. my, my mom has been dead 40, 40 years and she's never been on Facebook. So how could he possibly have known about her? And you're like, yeah. so the way I approach it now is I don't attack psychics. I, I say, let's talk about this one specific person in this one specific time and let's break it down and see what we can discover and i'm i'm completely leaving it open to when they're like but are there real psychics anywhere and you're like well i have you know i'm doing it really slow right where I'm, and i think that i'm winning you don't want to be you back. don't want to be mad at people for believing because yeah especially when it comes to psychics and talking to their lost loved one it's like i i can understand why you want to believe in this I, I don't want to take that away from you, but at the same time, there are reasonable explanations for how a psychic might have known that. Right. And yeah, there's an art to how you convince people. I, I know we've heard this before, like there's no nice way to tell someone they've dedicated their life to a lie. And so when it comes to explaining atheism to anybody, like I'm not, I don't go out of my way to tell someone they're wrong about religion because why is there any reason what's the point right. you've just spent all your life and all your money and all these relationships into this thing that we yeah think your like emotions are invested you you i mean for the people who live their life in the church you're volunteering your friends i've said this to atheists too you think a logical argument is going to stop someone from believing in god no because they a lot of people do not belong to a church because they logic themselves into it or the pastor makes sense to them every right. time no, no, they don't go for that. They go because of the community and what the church offers them. And if we don't have a way to connect with those people and give them some semblance of that, not necessarily an atheist church, but like if you don't have a way to, what do you do if you're sick and you, you need a helping hand or you live in a place where you don't have a lot of friends? Um, churches provide that for you. Like you can't get through to them unless you address that. And when it comes to psychics, this person wanted a meaningful connection and a psychic gave it to them for a few minutes. Don't be mad at the person. They wanted something. They got it. Like, you can be mad at the psychic. You can try to explain the process and why it's fake. But it's like, I, my heart kind of goes out to the victims of that stuff. Because, like, I'm not mad at you. It's not your fault. I, I, kind, I don't know necessarily your reasons, but I kind of know the gist of why that's appealing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it takes... I always appreciate when I read your articles and you explain these long, elaborate, but very well thought out, like ways to try to, uh, trap is the wrong word, but to catch these psychics in the act. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you planted this information for months and like, of course, you know that they're going to dig into this information you have planted for them. It's interesting because it's like, you're very clearly just saying, look, for anyone who might want to know how they're doing this, we're showing you the process. We're, we're showing you how the magic trick works. Right. It is um, a magic but, trick. It really is. But you can't force it down their throat. They have to go looking for it. And the nice thing is at least, and I say this as an atheist too, like what I like now is I don't have to say, read the Madeline Murray O'Hare book because it might be abrasive. Don't read the Dawkins book because it might have other problems. But I can always point them to, you should watch this person on YouTube. You should listen to this podcast or read this website because they might be able to speak to you in a way that I can't, or that it was one of those prominent names probably can't. Um, but there's so many options, which is amazing. Like We've I, changed overnight in, in my world, it feels like, you know, the world that I grew up in is at 18 or 19. This is like a, yeah, this is like totally a different world. I mean, just not only the internet, but just the, the proliferation of content out there that you can get, you know, when yeah. I was, when I was growing up, my big fear was spontaneous human combustion. <laughs> uh, that was terrifying. And I like yeah. to use that example because when I was a little girl and I heard about it, where would you go to find out <laughs> any information if that was real or not? I mean, there yeah. was nowhere. The Encyclopedia Britannica didn't even have anything. You couldn't go to a, a TV and turn... No, you couldn't go to the library. Any book you might have found would have been pro uh, spontaneous right. human combustion. Now we have a <laughs> proliferation of information out there. I, we need to teach people critical thinking skills to how to evaluate the reliable sources between evaluate this over this and how to think about what you're reading. But now, I try very wow. hard on YouTube, especially because I know it's a younger audience than my website. 
Um, I try really hard. Uh, I want to say dumb it down, but I think that's unfair. It's I try to write stuff that I think will play to an audience of kids who were like me when I was 14, where it's like, look, it's just, I'm just putting it out there. There's no weird language. I'm talking to you the way I would talk to you if we were having coffee together or something. Um, and maybe that will connect with somebody. But I, I never liked watching the people who are using big words or trying to lecture you or anything like that. So I hate talking like that too. Um, so I know like on YouTube, for example, I just try to make it like we're having a conversation and try to keep it not overly complicated. Just like, here's the thing that's interesting. Let's talk about that and why it's interesting. Why, why you should care about it. And whatever, if you do great. If you don't, I don't. Total <laughs> sense. Um, the one of the things I've been doing a lot with the articles I've been writing about the psychics is talking about how you know. Well, we shouldn't be making fun of these people because really, a lot of these people are raised in a, a, a culture where they believed in demons, angels, uh, life after death. So taking the step further to believing that a psychic could communicate with them. I mean, that's not a huge it, step. No, it's say. a teeny tiny step that some, right. you could find somebody who would be able to communicate with them. I mean, the Bible is riddled with people who are speaking to what God or whatever they're talking yeah. to people. And so it's, if that's how you're raised and you've never really challenged any of that angels, demons, you know, life after death, if you've never even considered that, then it's almost like these psychics have, uh, you know, such easy prey. You know, it's like right. shooting fish in a barrel or something like that. It's, 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 it's incredible. Okay. So let me, let me, let me look and see my list here real quick. I'm okay. getting, I want to tell people who are watching us on Facebook live, if you have questions, I'm not going to scroll through this long, long, long <laughs> feed right now. So if you have questions for, for him, it, please go ahead and put question and then your question right now. And that way I can, we can, uh, we can ask that. So I wanted to ask you a few more things. Let's see. I'll keep my answer short. Um, well, yeah. So what is, um, on your Wikipedia page, it said April 1st that you were on Jeopardy. Is that true? It was, yeah. Really was were? True. Oh, because there's a citation true. for that. Tell me what that was about. Yeah. Um, but April version, 1st, it made me really it was. suspicious. I know. No, uh, last, so this is what? What are we in? I lost track of time. We're in I, June I, now. I, I hear but, you. Uh, like January of last year, I've taken the online test before because they do it like once a year. They changed the rules now. They do it like all the time now, but they did it once a year. Um, I, I've taken the test before. I never heard back from them, which either means I failed or maybe I passed, but so did everybody else. And they just didn't pick me for the next step. And last sometime last year, they emailed me and said, hey, you passed the test. We want you to come for an in-person audition, which is phase Ooh. two. Um, I actually couldn't make it that day, and I told them that, and they're like, well, I'll tell you what, if you can't come to Chicago, where I live, they said, can you come to Milwaukee, like, later in the year, because we know we're going to be there. I'm like, yes. <laughs> you tell me the date, I will drop whatever I'm doing, and I will come there, but I can't make it to the Chicago one. And I thought I would never hear from them. They did email me and said, we're going to be in Milwaukee around Thanksgiving, uh, whatever date around there, come. I did. Basically, that in-person audition was another test where they ask you just 50 questions, boom, 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 you write down your answer, um, and it goes by fast. And basically, they want to see, did you cheat online? You know what I mean? Because you took oh, an online okay. test, because what All if you right. had 50 people around you yelling out answers? Um, they did that. Then they had us play a mock game where they told us, we don't care if you get the answer right. We just want to see how you do it. Because what they don't want to see is they have a question, and you're like, Buzz, what is blank? No, I'm sorry, that's wrong. <clears throat> oh, they don't want to see that. They want to see your personality, okay. <laughs> yeah, they want to How like, are you going to be oh. on camera? I remember one question they asked me was like, this random person I've never heard of was secretary of state to this president for 11 years. And I think they knew no one's going to know who this dude is. Ellen Airbright? <laughs> well, no, they, Albright? It was they said random person's name, but 11 years. And in my head, I'm like, oh, who's been in office for 11 years? That's got to be FDR. Oh, yeah. yeah and yeah. so I said that, and because they could tell I was working that out. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. And they're like, yeah, okay. I think they were like, that's kind of what we're looking for. And we had a little banter back and forth, but whatever. I will tell you that watching other people go up there, 
I thought there were plenty of people that I'm like, oh, that person seems comfortable and they look really good. So like, I'm sure they would look good on camera. And when they were bantering and sharing stories, I'm like, they were interesting and funny and I hate you because you're gonna <laughs> But um, we did that and they, they kind of told us, okay, I mean, it's November. They said, you can all leave. If we want you on the show, we will give you a call between now and a year and a half from now, or we might not call you. We probably won't call you. In which case, try again in two years. And I, there was someone at that audition who said this was her like fifth or sixth time auditioning in person, had never been called. Um, and I was shocked. They called me like a month later and said, uh -huh. we want you to be there. Uh, we taped at the end of January. They did a week of shows in did one you, day. Is this in Chicago? This was, no, this was in LA. They basically said, you're, you you're going to be- to LA? On. I flew me to LA. <laughs> they said, you fly yourself, you pay for the hotel, but when you lose, because everyone's going to lose, uh, you get $1,000 as a consolation prize, which will cover basically that amount. Um, so I went there at the end of January. They tape like five episodes on a Tuesday and five on a Wednesday. Um, and they do this twice a month. And that's how they keep it rolling. Um, I flew in on the Wednesday episode. And basically I got there. There were like 11 or 12 of us there, all contestants. One of them was a returning champion. And I was like, oh crap, that person's going to be a 90 game champion. And we're all lambs to the slaughter. Turned out the one person was like, I won on Friday with a little bit of money. Like I won the Friday episode with a little bit of money. And we're like, yes, we all have a chance. <laughs> um, but I honestly, like everyone there was, cause uh, there was an opera singer. There was a political, like get out the vote type of person. There was a social worker, very interesting, eclectic group of people. And we all spent like three hours in the morning just chatting with each other during an orientation. And like, they were all awesome. And like, none of us knew who was playing against each other. So we all just liked, I, I can speak for myself, I liked them. And they just said, okay, it's time. We've done all the basic stuff. Go in the studio audience. And we're all sitting there like, all right, for Monday's game, we have the returning champion and you and you, like they had their list and it wasn't me. So I'm just, I sat and watched a game. And then as soon as it was done, they were like, all right, for Tuesday's game, two other people. And I'm like, all right, not me again. And then for Wednesday's game, the third one that morning, it was me. So I got to run back to the green room. They touched up my makeup. We went and played. I can say this now. I won that game. And then it was a lunch break. And afterwards, we came back and they assigned two new players. I lost my second game. But uh sat around, watched Friday's game, and then left. And it was such a cool experience, like dream come true. Got to see Alex Crossed Ball. off your bucket list, huh? Totally, 100%. Um, <laughs> like, we don't get to talk to Alex Trebek at all. Like, what you see on TV is as much time as I got to see him, because he knows the stuff. Like, he knows the questions. He's gone through everything, so we, we are not allowed to have contact with him. But this was before COVID, so there was a studio audience, and we could get near him and talk. And uh, it was such an awesome, awesome bucket list sort of thing. And so that happened at the end of January. It aired on April 1st, that Wednesday episode that I was on. Um, and it was, it was cool. And unfortunately, like, everything was shut down, so I couldn't really have much of a viewing party or anything. But I, I will say, I do have a cool video of my parents coming over to watch it, because we didn't... Uh, my wife was there, but we didn't tell anybody uh, that I did, that I won a game. Right. And I honestly didn't even tell most people I was on until about a week before the show aired. And so what no one this? knew any of this. How did I miss this? <laughs> yeah, I... but uh, there was a cool video of like, because what happened in that episode that I won is that the final Jeopardy, none of us knew the answer. But I was like, I was losing heading into final Jeopardy. I bet a little bit of money. Um, thinking who are, the woman that's beating me is probably thinking I'm going to bet everything and she's going to try to top me. And my only hope is we all get it wrong. And so I bet a little bit of money. And what happened is the third place got it wrong, lost everything. I got it wrong, lost a little bit. And first place got it wrong. And I was like, what happened? What happened? What happened? And they revealed her bet. She bet pretty much everything. So that's how I won. But I, I was like, I know this is happening because this has been in my head now for two and a half months. Oh my goodness. That I haven't told anybody about this. And so we invited my parents to come watch it. And like, I do have video of them like 
coming to the realization that I didn't lose. So that was a nice moment of all. Of oh my gosh, I've got to see all this. So this is stuff on YouTube? <laughs> uh, there may be bootlegs. I'll send you a copy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah I, exactly. I got an in, you guys. I got an in. Let's see if we have any, <laughs> any questions. Question, would you, uh, this is from Mark Andrews. Would you consider volunteering with Foundation Beyond Belief Humanist Disaster Recovery Team? Yeah, so Foundation Beyond Belief is a charity for atheists. I was the chair of that organization's board of directors for a couple of years. Amazing group. It's one of the organizations I still donate to regularly. Um, their Humanist Disaster Recovery Team, I believe now, is basically if there's a hurricane or a tornado, they, they have boots on the ground, atheists that go there and help with recovery efforts, which is awesome because usually it's like Franklin Graham's group that tends to do that sort of thing. Um, would I consider volunteering? It, the answer is no, and only because I got two small kids and it would be really hard to go pick up and leave to go somewhere for a few right. days. So it'd Someday, be hard to do. On your bucket list. Yeah, but it's it's such an amazing organization. And if you are the sort of person that actually wants to like put your humanism in action and do something useful, mm -hmm. go look that up because it's an amazing group. Um, I'm not kidding. Like I give to them every month because I know they are run well, they do good work. Um, and honestly, if you're looking for an atheist group that is actually doing something besides arguing about God, there you go. You know, I'd be remiss if I don't mention that um, we'd love to have you come out to California when this is all over, hopefully someday. I would love yeah. to. I was going to say, I will go literally, no, if you said I, Antarctica for like a week, done. I, if you well, get me out of my house. <laughs> well, we're, we, have a, we have a conference out here in California that... Um, with Eugenie Scott, I'm sure you know. Oh, she's Scott. fantastic, yes. And uh, the Bay Area Skeptics, Sacramento Area mm. Skeptics, and so on, they they join forces and they put on a conference. I think they've done oh. 11. And That's this awesome. year, they asked people in outlying areas if they would do, you know, be in the, they would help with the running of the conference. And we got it together. Oh. We invited all these awesome people. And then COVID, yeah. you know. But one yep. of the things we do have, and this is so much fun, is one of the uh, members of the group, his name is B uh, Bill Patterson. He does a skepperty. And it's just like Jeopardy. <laughs> and he's, I've seen him do it a couple times. I have a local- I will uh, lose this now. Just, <laughs> I have a local uh, uh, Monterey County Skeptics. We do a Skepti Camp, which is one day of skept. Oh, I love that. I've done that in Chicago oh, way it's back so much then. fun. A lot oh of little God. like TED Talks and stuff. Yeah, and little awesome. TED Talks by non-professional people, but yes. Bill Patterson came and did Skepperty with us. And one of our, I don't know if you know who Mick West is. He's the, he runs Metabunk. He's a, an expert on contrails, chemtrails, okay. UFOs. He's, he's just a phenomenal person. But anyway, he's just really into, that just, is so I mean, cool. like that is his thing, you know? And so when we did Skepperty, he's like, I have to be on that team. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've watched it for years, but it's you know. was one of the few things I think I've done that anyone outside of well, that anyone gives a damn about. Because I promise you, no one in my life circles cares about any of the stuff I do. But like, <laughs> but but Jeopardy, they all know Jeopardy. They oh yeah, talk Jeopardy. About. Yeah, it's it's the yeah. same in my family. You know, I have my kids are in their thirties, thirty, thirty-two. If they could care less that I'm doing anything with psychics. It's like, oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm like, right. I got a lecture in in Poland. I'm going to go to Italy. I got this lecture go. in Australia, and they're like, oh, now they want nice. to be your friend. No, they're like, oh, that's a nice one. Uh, did I tell you that I, you know, did such and such? And you're like, do you not understand how cool your mom is? No, they don't understand. They get careless. Okay, so here's here's another question by Dale okay. <coughs> Porti. Sorry, Dale, if I'm saying your name wrong. I can't pronounce anything. Um, question were you discouraged about talking about atheism by jeopardy producers interesting so what i told them they said what do you do for a living that's a fair question i said i am a blogger and honestly i didn't purposely volunteer friendly atheist or anything they said what do you write about i said politics and religion so i've been very busy lately <laughs> <laughs> That's all they ever asked. And they basically, they didn't care about the specifics because they don't care about your politics and they don't care about your religion. So they said, what do you want us to introduce you as? I said, blogger. I'm proud of that. I like that. Um, and that's as far as it ever got with that. So I didn't purposely volunteer the information and they never asked about it. So we just, 
left it at that. That's pretty cool. Okay, yeah. so here's another question from Robin Canton, uh, another one of my GSOW editors. I have such awesome yes. people. Anyway, he says, what's the worst thing about the atheist movement right now? And then he puts <laughs> sorry, and I'm not sure why he put sorry on there. Robin, why? Because we're sorry? starting beefs now. I like it. Um, there's a, going back to what I said earlier, when I feel like when I got into the movement, which is when I was graduating from college, so like 04, 05, all that stuff, it felt to me, and this is probably not true, but it felt to me like everyone was on the same page in terms of what we were trying to accomplish, like mm -hmm. uh, where whether it was political or whether it was trying to get people to become atheists, whatever it was, people seemed on the same page. And because uh, of the so many resources are out there now, everyone is kind of doing their own thing, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But that also means you have people doing things that I personally don't love at all. So, I mean, look, I've, I've talked about them publicly, so I don't mind saying it here. There's a group called Republican Atheists. I don't agree with anything they do, <laughs> but, they, but they exist, and why not? Like, if they're, I, they believe in, you know, Republican values, and they happen to be atheists, like, of course, that's a thing that's gonna form. There are pro-life atheist groups. I disagree with them on that stuff. Like, so that's part of the thing where it's, I, I thought we had more in common and it turns out, nope, once it gets past the God question, there's a lot of issues that I disagree with that people are now starting to form groups about. There are also a lot of people who, their personalities on YouTube, for example, and the way they talk about things, they just rub me the wrong way. That's another issue where it's like when you have so many options to choose from, um, and this is true of cable news, this is true of any religious movement too, there are some voices you like and some you're like, I wish you would go away. Right. There's a, there's a ton. I couldn't end the list of names I could put on there. Um, and also like there's, I'm trying to think of other stuff that I dislike. Of course there are bad actors, there are people who act Badly, we've seen sexual harassment issues. We've seen all that stuff within organizations. People that I, I, I've said this before, where it's, I was always watching all the Me Too articles and all those stories from a distance because it didn't affect me because I live in such a little insular bubble of my own where I don't, I'm not part of a workforce. You know what I mean? Where I might have seen that stuff out in the wild. So when it happened to eight in atheist organizations where these stories were coming out beyond a whisper network. And now it's like, oh, these are people I've known for like six or seven years. And it turns out they were doing things to women that I knew. And I didn't know any of that. And to grapple with that and deal with that, it's frustrating to know that this was happening to people in the movement. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that stuff bothers me. I guess if but you want to general- human. <laughs> yeah. I guess if you want to generalize it, it's the fact that, oh, hey, we're not really that special. We are just like every other subculture and every other movement in which there are bad actors, there are people you wish would go away, there are, we thought we were smarter, we thought we, we were on the right track with so much of these important topics, and it turns out now we're pretty much the same just as every- Just all agree on the God question. Yeah, that and then God. beyond that, there's everything else the and diversity. it's like oh right this is why i like living in a bubble where i don't talk so to so let me ask you this uh where do you feel that we should be going from here what what i mean the goal in my life is i want to get to a point where religion is like whatever it's like what is your favorite football team yeah you know yeah, you yeah, go yeah. rah rah i really like this team for this reason and i like this one for this reason but it's not it's not something you're going to lose a friendship over. It's not something you're going to necessarily make decisions about your health on. And right. I would like to be at a point where, oh, what church you go to? What religion you are? Oh, you're not? Okay, whatever. And it's just like, oh, well, you should try, you know. So it's a non-issue. That's where I'd like it to get to. Sure. But I, 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 would I don't say, know how would we even get to that if that's even a, a goal. I don't know if that's possible. But I will say like in terms of goals, there are obviously legal goals and political goals, which atheist and church state separation groups can ally with progressive religious causes to work toward. We should absolutely do that. And there are groups doing that. Um, anytime I talk to a college audience, especially or a high school audience, which doesn't happen that much. What I would say is like, if they say, you know, what should I do? What can I contribute to this sort of movement? What I would say to them is, look, it's, you don't have to be a professional atheist per se, 
if you can find a way to create a platform and get people to listen or watch, great. But that stuff, I mean, very few people that I know who do that sort of thing actively try to do it. It just, it kind of happened to them. They've been doing it for a while. They figured out what works. But I would say, look, if you are going to be a teacher, for example, it would be great to have atheists who are really well versed in the policy aspects of it so that they are experts when it comes to the policy and they can debunk the bad stuff that comes out about like, because think about the controversies involved in just teaching, charter schools, vouchers, um, what's the best pedagogy to use in a classroom. There's so much BS in that world. Talk about medicine if you're a doctor or a nurse and like how much BS is there in the medical field? Obviously, I mean, we all know oh, yeah. there's so much bad information there. I want people to be experts in whatever it is that they are doing to the point where they, they are good role models in terms of uh, reasonable evidence-based thinking that they are known like for being the rational voices in that field. Because that to me is an implementation of critical thinking that we don't really focus on because it's not about God per se. Um, I just want people to be really good at what they do to the point where they are helping making those decisions. They are helping debunk the bad information because uh, the stuff that you're doing, the work that you're doing, that's awesome. Now we want people who are experts in every field that there is who can kind of do the same sort of work and say, look, uh, this video came out about medicine or about vaccines and let me be the voice that can help debunk that stuff because that is bad critical thinking. That would be a wonderful way to expand like the skeptical movement, I think. That would be an awesome thing to do. In terms of atheism specifically, I want to see, I mean, pushing back against the religious right has never really gone away. Um, but the legal groups that exist to fight that stuff, they've gotten larger and they've gotten better. Like they really do, talking to the AHA and the Freedom from Religion Foundation and American Atheists, like their legal teams know what they're doing. They have a good system set up. Those are important. Um, I actually have found less of a need to have like atheist spokespeople uh, per se. It's not like cable news is calling to have a, the voice of atheists anywhere. They used to do that a lot more. They don't really do that that much now. And honestly, I feel like there's so many resources out there that trying to focus on being, I don't know, the next Dillahunty, the next whoever it is. I don't know that, I mean, if you can do it as a hobby and make something of it, good for you. I don't know that it's worth trying to just do no money that. in it. <laughs> there's no I would say to anyone, I've seen a lot of people say, I want to write a book about atheism too. It's the same thing where it's like, you Start can, podcast. yeah, I mean, if you want to, great. I'm not, not saying right, don't like, do it, but don't do it because you think anyone's going to read it and because you're going to make money from it. Because right. no and no, unless, <laughs> it can unless, be a good outlet. Yeah, um, you know, do it because you want to. You know, when I, was, when I was a Christian, and I was a good Christian, I was like really into trying so hard. I mean, I attended church all the time and I played the piano and I was, in the, you know, I was trying so hard to be a good Christian or please my mom, but I wasn't confrontational and I'm still not really that kind of person that's confrontational. I'm not either. And you know, what they taught me was be a good person and let people know Jesus through your, your actions. Yeah. And, and, and that kind of stayed with me and that's kind yeah. of how I've always been. It's like, I mean, I'm not going to go around and say, hey, I'm an atheist, I'm an atheist, I'm an atheist, I'm an atheist. It's not, but it is there. I mean, well, I have a Wikipedia page, so now it's really there. But the, you know, if people ask you would, and are interested, you, you can let them know you're an atheist. But I like to let them see me as, you know, how am I, um, am I truthful? Am I kind? Am I generous with my time and my, you know, I, I do the same thing. Say, I never you're lead. You're a good person and you're an atheist, you know? Right. I never I lead with the, the atheist thing either. Do. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have a very, very, very good friend that's a creationist and, and we've been to friends for, for hundreds of years, it feels like. And um, when that's I was cool. growing up, I had, no, <laughs> yeah, I had no atheist role models, of course. But 
she told she's really into her 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 faith and her christian and her church and she's a leader in the church and you know big thing but what she used to tell me is she'd say she would tell her friends and the people in the church she'd say oh my atheist friend susan this my atheist friend susan that <laughs> and then she would tell me susan you would be the best christian ever you are just like you know you're so all these categories of things that i am she you know she would say and i thought <laughs> keep telling all your your you know, all those people about your atheist friend and how awesome I, you know, how I am. And because I didn't have any, any of that. And so what's weird is so many younger people today, like, I don't think that would even happen that much because you kind of swing your arm in a high school and you've hit an atheist. Like there's a <laughs> yeah, bunch yeah, of people true. out there. It's not, it's same thing with being LGBTQ. Like, it's just not a thing if it, you're in a larger community. In some parts, now wait, let's take this back. Yeah, is, in some parts, for I, sure. Is, where so. I'm, when I've gone to Australia, New Zealand, and a lot of places in England, you know, Europe, it is, they they think they have a religion or some pseudoscience problems over there. And I look at them, I say, you don't have a clue. You've got like <laughs> five psychics here who are just, horrible they they yeah. don't have much of a name you know your religion is not that big uh big of a deal or anything like that so in their little bubble they think they you know oh yeah we got some problems but we're not really all that religious and in california where i'm at we're pretty cosmopolitan especially where i'm at <laughs> but you go to some of these places in the southern states and religion is all they can talk yeah. about. And it's the like Canadians saying we have political issues. I'm like, you're adorable. <laughs> <laughs> like, I know, I know you do, but come on. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I definitely get it. So here's another question. Um, do you think U.S. cities should have, oh, this is from Dell. Do you think U.S. cities should have an ask an atheist booth in public parks and benches to encourage face-to-face -face interaction and education? Yeah, so let me broaden that question. If, if there is an atheist group and there's some large uh, social thing going on, like a big fair, a big event, local event, there's it's a wonderful thing to do to either pay for a booth or set up a booth, whether it's to advertise your organization or to just literally set up a table with a thing that says ask an atheist anything. Because there are people who want to, I mean, I've, I've heard this from people who have done that sort of thing. So many people want to ask you about your atheism. So right. many people just want to talk to like an exotic animal that they've never seen before, whether it's to argue <laughs> or just like, how do you function in life? And if you can be out there and just to say, I'll talk to you, like, you don't, you can ask me whatever you want. How do I have morals? Let's talk about it. It's a nice conversation because usually that's the sort of topic you're not supposed to bring up in polite right. conversation. So, man, if you have, if, uh, to Dale, to anybody else, like if you have people willing to do that with you so you're not alone and you could set up a table and it's you safe. have the money to, yeah, and it's safe and you could set up a booth or something, whether it's on a college campus too, because they have activity fairs and stuff like that, that stuff is awesome. Plus, you can hear from people who genuinely care. Like, I, I don't know if you feel the same way, like, I kind of appreciate Christian apologists who argue about this stuff because I know they're as passionate about it as I am on the opposite side. Doesn't mean I like to talk to them about this stuff, but like I, I do have a little bit of respect for the passion they put into it because they're not just half-assing it. They're not just going through right. their day, I'm a Christian. They're like, no, I want to defend this. I care about this. And when you have a booth of like, I, I would say the same thing if there was like an ask a Christian anything, like I might be drawn to that, to ask what I think is a, a stumper of a question. That could be fun to do. And especially yeah. if the person is nice to talk to. Right. That's fun. I wouldn't but, mind talking to like, ask a Jehovah Witness something. Yeah, like Scientologist exactly. Scientologist or ask a Mormon or I, I wanted to start, and I've seen this done in other areas, is like a table that says, ask a scientist. And Ooh, then people just yes. come up and just ask a question. But see, I want it in Spanish. I want it to be, uh, you know, where yeah. they ask, uh, we have a huge- This is where you get it. your group, any members who can join and yes. Right, well, yeah, so that, like, we need scientists to speak Spanish and I'm sure there's sure. Some, This is just one of those things on my to-do list of things. But the, my but very the general long. point is if you're able to do it and it's safe and you can like, yeah. you have that opportunity, that's such a cool thing because so many people would like to talk especially in a non-confrontational yeah. yeah just to say you know i don't I, I keep hearing about this climate change thing what what is that and could you right. explain that to me in some way i mean what is it about the earth getting warmer 
just the or even just they imagine want. they came to you and they're like okay what well i swear i had this conversation with someone close to me they're like okay i saw that pandemic video but it seems kind of believable yeah and so we have that conversation and stuff but like if there was an atheist and they're just like oh i can ask anything like that's I, yeah, by the way where, the where do you go when you die that's what i've heard yes that's a like, great uh, question i go nowhere it, <laughs> that's a great, that's an awesome question that I'm sure has been sitting in their heads <laughs> forever, and they've probably in some places it's a real never had a too. Yeah. But I um, think by the way, the Secular Student Alliance, a group that focuses on high school, college atheist groups, they actually have a designated Ask an Atheist Day where they encourage groups them. to set up a table like this on campus, apropos of nothing, just set it up to do it because they know, like, if people just see you on campus and they wanted to ask you something, they might do it. That's a good starter. And, and it's, it's not be about proselytizing. Starting, starting to get your skills of how to have that conversation with oh, people. Oh, yeah, And you for see sure. where they're coming. Oh, it's, I think it's valuable. I think mm -hmm. the more interaction we have with people who don't necessarily see it the, the world the way we do, it's super valuable. Robin, yes. Robin has a statement here. He's from um, Montreal. He says, <laughs> As another Canadian said, being Canadian right now is like living in an apartment just above a crack house. <laughs> that is so... I, hey, let me tell you, if, if there's another, if Trump wins this next election, I swear, I'm going to New Zealand. I swear. I, I loved won't... it there. I love, there's a lot of places I love, but New Zealand seems New like... New Zealand is not letting any of us in. They know better. Oh, no, I've got, I've got, <laughs> I've already put in, I have already, uh, you know, got got people in there who are here's what they're gonna vouch me. for me i'm gonna get in there i know here's what scares me summer of 2004 um like i became politically cognizant in at the end of by the end of high school ish but like in 2004 i was done with college i was about to enter grad school i did an internship at the center for inquiry in uh amherst or buffalo yeah, new york uh -huh. yeah and basically like obviously we were doing other things it wasn't a political thing but everyone there was more or less like, George W. Bush is horrible. 9-11 happened. We started this war. This is horrible. Uh, eh, do we love John Kerry? Eh, whatever. You got to get Bush out of office. Like, that was the general mindset. I even remember Michael Moore had a movie that came out that year, uh, Fahrenheit 9-11, where he was talking about this stuff. Like, I went to see that on opening night with a group of activists like, I've never had a more fun experience in a theater because, like, everyone's booing at the screen or throwing popcorn at the screen. It was so much fun. But I'm telling you, like, I seriously sat there thinking, oh, my God, yeah, he's horrible. He's totally going to lose, and John Kerry's going to win. And obviously that didn't happen. But the fact that, like, I didn't realize that the second term was a possibility, that still kind of haunts me where it's like, what did I not see? Because I felt like, because I was clearly in a bubble surrounded by people who right. thought it was going to change. And I clearly wasn't representative. And I'm just saying like, it could happen. Uh, I know Biden, I think people, his people tweeted this today. I know the polls look good. It doesn't matter. I need you to volunteer, donate, yeah. whatever it is. But it's like, yeah, it doesn't we can't, matter. We can't, we can't. Uh, and that, and I want to point that out. Anybody who says, what can I do? What can I do? Vote, vote, people. Yeah, vote, vote, drag people with you to Take vote, get people to you. early vote, uh, volunteer with a local campaign. Uh, and and the down needed. vote too is important. All the things on there every year for the last three or four or five years at my house, we always have the, our local skeptics group and any neighbors and people's friends yeah. that come over. And we have a, a, a sit in at my house, everybody brings their voting ballots and we go through each line. Everybody has to do the research. And there so is a, we'll, we'll be like, okay, what is everybody voting on? Proposition, whatever. Who's got an argument for it? Who's got an argument against it? I got I involved with, uh, as purely a spectator, but there was a group, uh, a one woman started it. It was just called Get Her Elected. I, I hope I'm saying the name right, but I think it was Get Her Elected. And their whole thing is we're trying to get progressive women elected to any office at any level. And all they did, this is my only interaction with them, I get emails from them like once or twice a week, especially as the, the campaign season heats up. And they say, here's a list of things that these candidates could use help with, whether it's website stuff, social media stuff, 
uh, pol policy issues, grunt, grunt work. Oh, interesting. But they just listed it. And there were some of them who were like, I need help because we're going to have a debate and I don't know how to do that well. Or I need help with my social media pages. And if you are someone who has expertise in these areas and you want to volunteer to help out, you could send an email. They had a way so it's not just you bombarding right. one person. You went through a middleman, so to speak. But um, I remember last year I was uh, basically doing a video chat with someone who was doing a debate on stage. And she's like, what advice do you have? I'm like, well, I coach public speaking. This is my wheelhouse. And I remember going through one of her stump speeches that she had on YouTube. I listed out notes. We had a conversation over YouTube. We talked about it. Um, and that was kind of the end of it. But like, it was a, there are so many sites like that. That was get her elected. But there are other websites like that where they're just like, we want to get progressive candidates in office. And if you want to help out, um, I have a, my podcasting partner was knocking on doors for our local congresswoman who did get elected. There are so many things people can do that don't require giving money if you don't have it. And that you can do even if you're like an introvert or you don't want to be out there or whatever it is. So yeah, there's a lot out there for people to do. And there's expertise people have that you yes. didn't realize somebody needed that for. So we don't have any more questions, but I do want to ask you, uh, what's because <laughs> I followed this saga for a long time. What's the latest with Ken Ham's uh, uh, the, the Ark Museum, the, the Noah's Ark oh thing? Okay, so let's new? see. They just opened up on Monday, again, after the pandemic. No masks. You don't have to wear a mask. Um, he did release a video on opening day, and I did not see a lot of people walking in that place. I, I wouldn't don't know. do it. No way. But it's scary. The, so I don't know how the pandemic affects their thing, because their whole thing is based on attendance and making money and stuff. Uh, it seems to be going fine. It's not gone under yet. Um, they're still functioning. It's going. I don't know how much of an impact they have. Did he get one money from the government, you think, to keep it he, open? Uh, I don't know sure to keep it open. He did get money as a tourist attraction where they get a tax incentive because they are bringing tourists to Kentucky. Right, but not to fire people, I guess you would have to have. Yeah, um, but as far as I know, there hasn't been some massive layoff other than the pandemic. Like, they haven't right. done anything crazy or anything. I um, can't imagine they, it's still open. I just don't... I know. I, I don't... I, it's too early to tell because um, every month, uh, Dan Phelps, who is a paleontologist in Kentucky, does a wonderful right. job of collecting attendance figures that are reported to the state. And, and you could see the trends and they kind of go up and down. And like the months you think a lot of people would go to a museum or an attraction are the same as it would be for like Disney World, just smaller numbers. But it's not like significantly going down or anything. So who knows? But the most interesting thing is they are still dealing with a million dollar lawsuit because there was a flood and it wrecked part of the ark and they are battling with their insurers over who has to pay Fair that. Flood. <laughs> it's, been, it's been over a year and they're still trying to decide the scope of the lawsuit and I follow it. Like there's not much movement right now because they're still working out details before they get into the, all right, let's battle this out. The okay. irony of all that. I oh, remember watching Jessica go through, uh, uh, when it opened up, she was there with her um, doing a live video feed. We have yeah. another question from Dale. He says, <coughs> him that busted me for trolling Craigslist with an ad for people who would pretend to be Christians experiencing miracles about three years ago. <laughs> Does he still monitor Craigslist for things like this? No. I don't know what he's talking about. What is what is that? I don't remember that one specifically. I haven't monitored that site or any other one, but every now and then I will get an email saying I saw this posting somewhere, whether it's on Facebook or somewhere else, where someone is uh there was one like I don't remember if it was a pastor that posted it, trying to figure something out. But usually, like it's it's become a lot easier to figure out who's a uh, a good apple and a bad apple when it comes to posting that stuff. Like if they're uh -huh. fake, it's pretty easy to call them out. Sometimes I will see things where I'm like, "Is this for real?" And it's pretty easy. Like I don't hesitate about this anymore. I will reach out to them and say, "I need details." So I'll give you an example. Last week, there was a guy who posted a thing. He said, "Like my on Twitter, it went viral." My friend said he got this letter from his ex high school girlfriend's dad, who's pissed off that he took her virginity. It's been 10 years. The dad wrote him a letter saying like, I'm gonna come after you. God's gonna come. Like it was 
crazy. And this guy posted it on Twitter and it's like, do you believe him or not? Like, this seems like a fake letter. It's insane. I reached out to the guy. I'm like, listen, I'm, I'm a reporter, I guess. But like, I, I want to talk to your friend. I will maintain anonymity if that's the fear. And I got in touch with the friend. I called him really? up. We had a long conversation on the phone and he's like, it is a real letter. He got the humor of it, but also he's like, I don't live where he sent the letter to anymore. So like, I'm not afraid of the dad. God knows where he is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but he basically said he dated this girl. And at the time in high school, she had an overprotective dad, but that's not a weird thing. Um, but he's like, the girl doesn't feel that way. He doesn't feel that way. Like it's only the dad who seems disturbed by this. That's kind but of I, I was able to verify at least the details where it's like, okay, that was a real thing that happened. If it was something like what Dale's bringing up, usually I would email that person and say, all right, I want to know more details because I'm writing about this. And either they will fess up or they won't. I do try to figure out if I'm going to write about something that seems trolly or someone emails me a link and they're like, is this for real? Right. I will do what I can to try to verify it to the best of my ability. Um, and it happens a lot on Facebook where people will be like, I saw this thread somewhere, someone posted this, but I don't know if this person's actually this. Oh, here's an, ex last year, I think there was this guy who was, who said something racist at a city council meeting. Like, I forgot what it was, but it was obscenely racist. And it was also in a very rural part of the state or something. And it's like, does he realize what he said and how insane it was? And I remember like, I tried to get in touch with him. I couldn't do it. I got to call up his like son-in-law that night. And basically I'm like, can help me walk through this. Like, does he know this is racist or is he just like an old guy who says stupid stuff? And what this son-in-law basically told me is like, that does sound like something he would say. Uh, I think my understanding was like, he has family members that try to talk him out of saying stupid things, but it's hard. Like, <laughs> like I, I have found that those emails those conversations are always so much more interesting oh there was one where david barton the christian pseudo historian said something about when they took atheist or when they took god out of public schools which didn't happen but they stopped right, mandatory yeah. bible readings but i remember i emailed ellery shemp who was one of the plaintiffs in that infamous case that took mandatory bible readings out of school and i'm like hey ellery do you have any comment on what barton said about your case and Ellery wrote back with one of the all-time just wonderful lines, something about like, oh God, of course I set it up and I don't remember the line, but he just said something like, well, there's a talking snake for you if you ever needed one. <laughs> but it's the, the follow-up, the, the attempts to verify some of these stories are sometimes way more interesting than even the stories themselves. So I, I would hate it if I posted something that turned out to be a hoax. Um, so I do try to at least say, this is what happened, or at least this is what they're saying happened. Don't take my word for it, but I'll share it. it. Happens a lot in Africa too, where they're like, this pastor killed somebody, or this pastor literally had a body come back to life out of the coffin, and it seems so fake. And you're like, they really did this? And sometimes you could see the actual video and how it all worked out. It's weird. Oh, don't even start on Africa. That's awful. Rob, who told me he was leaving, because it's probably like, midnight where he's at in in uh, new jersey yeah. <laughs> i don't know how this time zone thing works you know it's it's, it's kind of confusing to me so he's probably writing this from bed i'm a new helpline volunteer for recovering from religion which i first heard about on one of the aca shows has him at discuss this worthy org on his blog or podcast which is I a, have. a plug a plug out about it <laughs> yeah recovering from Thanks religion for making me re has, reading that rob they have so many awesome programs one i don't know if this is what Rob is referring to. They have like a 1-800 type of line where you can yeah, talk to an atheist. There. That is still going on. That program is on. So like I've told people this. I actually have it auto-saved as a reply on Facebook because I've recommended it so often when people are like, I want to talk to an atheist. And I'm like, I don't have time right now. But I will say like, if you go to Recovering from Religion, they have a person you could get a hold of. You could talk to them on the phone. You could chat with them online if you want to. Um, they also, I think, do uh, addiction recovery program, maybe. Maybe that's a thing they used to do. But Recovering from Religion has a lot of awesome programs for people who are, like, deeply into religion and having doubts, and they feel like they have nowhere to turn to. So, yeah, to, to Rob's question, I've definitely talked about it and mentioned it, and 
um, whenever they are doing something new, I think they usually get in touch with me too. So right. I can okay. post about it. So here's another one of my GSOW editors, Alessandro, Alessandro Max. He says, hey, Hannah, I'm a regular listener to Friendly Atheist. Evangelicals here in Brazil are pretty crazy, but I have to say that in America, they're even crazier. Unfortunately, evangelicals here are importing several political tactics from there. Yeah, Bolsonaro is something else. Isn't that I, scary? Yeah, I it's did. scary living in America. God, I can't imagine what Brazil would be like. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, he can correct me on this, but like I heard there was like possibly to the point where they're going to like overthrow this guy because of how bad he's doing and what's going on with the pandemic. And they're just hiding all the information at this point. Like, it, it seems like at least people are bubbling up against him. I do remember, like, when was Bolsonaro elected? A year or two ago? Like, as it was happening. Ago, at least yeah, but you could, you could see the polling coming in, and it's like, oh, no, he's doing well. And there is a challenger who's decent, but, like, this guy is doing – and from, from me typing here, I'm like, no, we've <laughs> been through this. Don't do it. Don't do it. Like, Britain Walk made away. the same mistake with Brexit. We made the mistake. Don't you do it too. And then it just, the polls kept going. And it's like, he's going to run away with this. And he did. Um, but I feel for you because I, it's scary. It's got to be scary in Brazil. Does oh it, yeah. Does, uh, does Rob mentioned like, the secular therapy yeah. project. Secular does, therapy is awesome too. Doesn't it feel like time has just, well, you were, when you were talking about George Bush, yeah. I was like thinking, oh, Three and a half man. centuries ago. I yeah. know, but, wouldn't you love to have him in office right now? <laughs> I mean, with the hindsight that I have now, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I remember in 2019 thinking, God, 2019's over. This is going to be so awesome to have 2020 where we're going to have the election <laughs> and we're going to just skate right. through. And the next thing we know, it's going to be the election. Doesn't it? Two tweets like that were hilarious. Someone tweeted today, I think I retweeted, like, uh, in the future, historians are going to specialize in which quarter of 2020. Oh yeah, they did. But I, someone tweeted something like, "There was a month in 2016 when everyone was outside playing Pokemon Go and it was beautiful out, and Hillary was going to win." There was like, a, remember we that? Remember that day <laughs> over and over, like Groundhog Day. We'll have that. Yeah. Day. I just it's really one of those tweets that I just keep thinking about. I'm like, I was that person <laughs> that summer. Well, I had uh, released a blog. It just came out. Oh, not blog. I released an article today. I had this idea of let's look and see what all the psychics said about COVID, you know, and what they're doing. So I just launched it today and I've been having so much fun going on Twitter and calling out. I did screenshots of all these psychics. There was like, yeah. it was easy. And they're just mm -hmm. psychics that said, oh, hey, I'm going to be in such and such in June or I'll be so and so in April or I'm going on vacation. And you're like, well, why are you planning these things if you're a psychic? Didn't you know that this was going to happen? <laughs> right. And I put them all in one article, and right. and uh, you know people are telling me that was just a really good idea. I, just get it all in one place. That all these, all these psychics, not a single one of them mentioned right. COVID. Not a single one of them. I mean, it is obvious because they, they make the plans and then they have to cancel them. So obviously you did not see it coming. It's like- I, I would add uh, to that, like I used to take those types of screenshots when it came to evangelists, televangelists, predicting things about politics or whatever. Right. Um, because, I mean, I would even make a note to myself. I do this today too with some cases, but it's like, make sure to look back up to see how they did with this prediction. Yeah. Because um, that might make for interesting fodder. But it's- so frequent at this point that I can no longer just keep track because they make so many bad predictions and it happens so regularly that it's not a matter of, oh, what did Jim Baker say back in February? No, just go back and see what I wrote because he said 90 different things and they were all insane. Mm -hmm. And it's so many people, like it's not just one dude. My favorite, I think there was, uh, I was this 2000? It was, 2008 or 2012, right before uh, Obama's election in one of his terms, Focus on the Family released a fake letter. I know. Focus on the Family released a fake fictional letter saying, if we allow him, if he wins, then four years from now, here is the letter you will write your grandkids. Because <laughs> they know their audience. And they had a list of like 40 things that were going to happen. Away. Yeah. Yes. And they had like in Communism. school, they will be like learning about, I don't know, how atheist God, whatever it is. It was 40 insane predictions. 
And uh, my friend Libby Ann, who is a blogger at Pathios, maybe it was 2008 they wrote this letter. And then in 2012, she remembered it. She went back and went through all of their predictions. And I think maybe one and a half came true out of 40. And of course, it was totally innocuous, one and a half too. But like, they do this all the time now, though, these predictions about doomsday scenarios that never actually pan out. Yeah. Crazy. I, it feels like every day that we're living right now is like five days or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it both, the, the, what's the saying? Like the days are long, but the years are short or something. Like, I hope we look back on it and think, oh yeah, that flew by. But like right now it's. It is dragging on and yeah. on and on. It's incredible. So <laughs> let's see. That'll if someone said like two months ago, Trump got impeached. I, it was more than that. But like, you know what I mean? It like, wasn't that long. Whatever, yeah. It wasn't that long ago. It or was definitely. Like Pete long. Buttigieg was in the race two months ago. <laughs> like, you oh, could totally get away with saying that and people would totally Pete. believe you. Oh I my know. gosh. It's horrible. Okay, so I've gotten through my list and I don't see any more questions. Is, All right. Is there anything else that you wanted to make sure that we got in? on this call or any questions or anything that I know if anyone has any other questions uh you can find me online I'm not hard to find but, uh, <laughs> yeah, you're like me <laughs> yeah thank thank for you everywhere. for anyone who stuck through that was fun I had fun yeah, talking to you Susan for the for first time in forever that was a lot of fun it really was that yeah. made all these I probably didn't even have to have any of these questions so the things I want to make sure I mention is that this video will appear on our YouTube channel well if you're watching it now you're going to find it on the YouTube channel for about time project and um, if, uh, if you want to put it on your YouTube channel, that's fine too. I, I have no problem oh, cool. with that. Um, I will use, uh, somebody in my Wikipedia group will use this to update your Wikipedia page where your <laughs> it was, was at. Uh, especially that bit about Jeopardy because it didn't say anything in your Wikipedia page about Jeopardy other than you were on Jeopardy on April 1st. Oh. <laughs> which of course, raises a red flag on April 1st. If that's sure, the sure. There is, a, there is a Jeopardy archive, like J-Archive, that I yeah. used to study uh, because it has a recap of every game and every question and what the answers were oh, and all that. I didn't I, know that. I used it to study like insanely for a month and a half while I was prepping. But uh, they have actually a recap of the show that is pretty uh, extensive. Okay, well, well there, that's care. something we could use. Yeah. So I should also mention that um, not only will this appear on our channels, um, I would, if people out there are interested in um, keeping, keeping people like uh, Himmet and myself and the organizations we tend to represent, please uh, consider sponsoring all the things we've mentioned. Uh, Himmet's also, um, this is his living. Um, you can also donate to us uh, about Time Project. We just two days ago got our clearance with PayPal. So we are hey, now, hey. We've been a nonprofit for a while, but we finally got PayPal to acknowledge it. So we get a very good chunk of whatever is donated to us. And I'll have a link in our show notes for that. And also please subscribe to all the various things that we do. Uh, lots of people are saying thanks to you, Hema. And oh, thank you, everyone. And you know, I guess yeah, please subscribe to YouTube for both of the yeah, channels we're talking about, these, and uh, share them, and, uh, yeah. and and it's it's fun, and come hang out again. So um, let me think. Was there anything else? This, I like this format. It worked out well. So it's just I did too. This was fun. And then we can look. It's nice because I have another computer screen right here where I nice. can look at and see people going through. I wanted to see if you had a COVID beard. I was kind of curious. If you I, had... dude, I finally got a haircut this week and it was glorious. I'm not going anywhere. Grocery shopping. <laughs> and that's about it. I haven't really been anywhere else. All right. Thank you so much. All right. This is a lot of fun. And say hi, Jessica. And the kids. I will. I look forward to seeing you in person one of these days. Someday. And thank you all for it'll watching. Be nice look, it'll be nice to see anybody in person someday. <laughs> I totally agree. Yes. I appreciate right. it. Have a good one, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you.